Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Beneath the ominous profiles of cowardice that dominated the 2016 presidential campaign season, there was a bright spot. Independent presidential candidate Evan McMullen of Utah, patriotic constitutionalist, former CIA officer, and entrepreneur. In the New York Times, McMullen pointedly clarified Trump's threat to the Constitution, his lack of any basic knowledge of the founding creed, and moreover his dictatorial tendencies, regularly questioning judicial independence, freedom of the press, equal protection under the law. Instead, Trump to date has channeled a path of political retribution, a need for absolute attention, provocations that distract the media and his opponents, what McMullen deems the authoritarian's playbook. This is, of course, the poisonous injection of ignorance and authoritarianism into the bloodstream of American DNA and politics. But will it be a death sentence? Evan joins me now to discuss this. Thank you for being here, sir. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. I know that you go on and your campaign continues, so you certainly are operating from the point of view that it's, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. Mm -hmm. the, the Donald Trump's presidency doesn't have to be a death sentence? No, I, I, I think I think it does present a potential significant challenge to the country. I mean, we'll of course see how President Trump actually governs. Uh, but I also think that if he governs in the way that he says he would, or that he has said he would, which is in a way that I believe is akin to or uh, can be defined as authoritarianism, there will be an opportunity for Americans to maybe learn anew the value of liberty and the value of our democratic system and the Constitution that supports it. Uh, these are things that perhaps the, that we as Americans need to learn from time and time again, time, from time to time and be reminded of. And so there is a silver lining. And, and I see you know, constitutional conservatives on the right, and I see people on the left uh, who are learning these lessons again and who are finding common ground with each other on defense of our democracy, on the basic cause of liberty and equality in America. And, and that's also exciting. So there's room, there's, there's opportunity for optimism here, but it's in a broader context of potential great challenge. Why do you think we were, to use a word that you used in the New York Times op-ed you wrote in December, seemingly desensitized at a certain juncture in the campaign to what proved to be time and time again demonstrable ignorance mm -hmm. combined with the I only philosophy mm -hmm. that he touted, Trump touted during his RNC nomination speech. It's not as if we woke up or the Republican primary electorate woke up one morning and said we want to nominate someone who borders in terms of his personality along the lines of a dictator? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things are at play here. First of all, in the United States for the last several decades, our Constitution and our basic rights have basically been protected. And I, it, we're not perfect, and, and anyone watching this shouldn't think that that's my message, because it isn't. We're not perfect. We're not a perfect country, and there are ways that we still need to ensure that the cause of liberty is expanded in our country and protected. 
Um, but, but more or less, our democracy, our constitution, our basic rights have been protected over the last several decades without great threat. Now, so as a result of that, as a byproduct of that, I believe that we may have forgotten exactly how those rights are protected and what goes into protecting those rights, namely the Constitution, our democracy built upon that and the democratic norms associated with that that are also absolutely critical. And so when we see a, a new leader rising to power in the United States and they are exhibiting authoritarian tendencies, we don't understand perhaps the, the danger of those and the cost of those. Uh, now we will see how President Trump governs. Now we may all be pleasantly surprised and even today I desperately hope that I am. Uh, but, but if we are not surprised if he, if he governs the way he said he was going to govern, uh, those who uh, were not able to perhaps identify these authoritarian tendencies earlier on because they hadn't seen them before, uh, they, we will learn those lessons as a country, and then I think uh, we will be less desensitized to, the, uh, to Donald Trump's activities. Uh, but during the campaign, for example, when people, I believe, as I say, a lot of people just hadn't experienced this before, uh, it's easy to be desensitized, desensitized to something uh, that you don't fully understand or the, ram the ramifications of which you don't fully understand. And we in America have been blessed with uh, with a democracy that's been relatively healthy over the last several decades. Over the last several decades, but mm -hmm. it was in the wake of a decade of dysfunction, obstinance and dysfunction, mm -hmm. you could argue what seemed to be eternal gridlock that this came out of the woodwork. You were explicit about the authoritarian concern on the campaign trail. I think mm -hmm. Secretary Clinton was not necessarily, um, perhaps there was a fear of over-intellectualizing the problem. Um, I don't know, but at this point, mm -hmm. we have federalism, which is the blessing of separation of powers and, of course, mm -hmm. federal, state, local, mm -hmm. which will give rights to mayors, governors, mm -hmm. to challenge federal dictates, but also to engage in their own kind of governance that might mm -hmm. be opposing the federal direction. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, what is the toolkit that mm -hmm. you espouse the citizens employ to ensure that it doesn't go off the rails? Well, there are a number of things, but before we get to that, yeah. I, I, would, I would like to comment on something you mentioned, which is the issue of federalism and the issue of gridlock. So, you know, as a constitutional conservative, and that's what I consider myself, uh, you know, we are concerned about the size of the federal government and the centralization of power in Washington. And the reason, part of the reason why we've been concerned about that for so long is that we knew that someone like perhaps President Trump could take power in the United States and leverage all of that authority in Washington, more specifically in the executive branch, uh, to do things that, that they shouldn't or that we wouldn't, that would be uh, undesirable in America or for American citizens. And so that's an important thing right now. Uh, I believe that a lot of the gridlock we experience comes from the fact that we have so much power in Washington, which means that all the states and companies and individuals, voters, that we all fight over decisions in Washington because they're so important because so much of the power has migrated to Washington over the last several decades for a variety of reasons, and more specifically to the executive branch. So with President Trump, we may see why that's such a problem. But, but I would say that we, we definitely need to think very seriously about returning power to the states, about ensuring that legislative power is, is, is centered in Congress, where Article I of the Constitution says very clearly it should be. These are very important things that we need to do in the long term. And now in the short term, what do Americans do to ensure that their basic rights in the Constitution are upheld? There are a number of things that need to be done. I think one of the first things we need to do is ensure that we are very aware. We need to be very, very attentive to what the administration is doing, to what our government is doing. We need to find various trustworthy sources of news that must be multiple. Don't just rely on one. You need to identify, we as Americans all need to identify a number of news sources that we find credible. We need to understand what their biases may be. We need to uh, then make sure that we read and watch a lot. 
And then we need to be vocal when, it's, when that's necessary. We need to be extremely vocal. So when we see perhaps uh, President Trump do something that we think violates our most fundamental ideals in our Constitution, uh, we need to take to Twitter like he does, for example, or we need to make phone calls to representatives and senators in Congress, which leads me to the next thing. You know, not only do we need to write and be vocal, write op-eds, be very vocal, this, this sort of thing, tweet, post on Facebook, organize friends, send letters. We also need to engage much more frequently with our elected leaders in Congress because they're not going to stand up to Donald Trump, most of them. Some, there are some, you know, some people who are showing some courage. Signs of life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and I'm encouraged by that. And there will be more, I, I'm hopeful. Um, but they represent their people. And it is important for we, as their people, to, in, to make sure they understand that we expect them whether they're Republicans or Democrats, to stand up to Donald Trump when necessary. And that's especially true for Republicans. So how do we do that? How do we ensure that happens? It means that, and it's not you know, perhaps a, a sexy solution, but a phone call to your representative's office registers with them. You know, if there are many phone calls, that especially registers. So we need to be doing that. I would make a challenge to the American people to once a week pick up the phone and call your representative and your senator's office in Congress and tell them what you think about whatever's happening. It's very important, especially if you feel strongly about something. But these are the kinds of things we need to do. And then the last thing I'll mention here, although there are many things, the last thing I'll mention is that we need to be proactive about identifying wise and honest leaders and then promoting them into office. Right now, we as the American people, we tend to be fairly passive in this regard. The Republicans and the Democrats present people to us or individuals decide whether they're going to run or not. That's all fine. Um, but we don't go and find people who we think are prepared to lead us and who who offer the kind of leadership that will take us forward, not backward, and who will unify us, and, and who will put the interests of the country and our interests first. That's what we need to do. We need to be more proactive. We need to find those people among, this and among us and, and promote them into office. When you're Republican contemporaries, I know you ran as an independent, but mm -hmm. you were involved in the Republican caucus from a policy perspective, but when your Republican counterparts like Ben Sass of Nebraska or Jeff Flake of Arizona were appealing to the intelligence of the country. Mm -hmm. They seem to be denied the voice. And when you say signs of life, John McCain, who may be immortal, and we'll, we'll see how the Trump presidency tests his mortality, but I think he was so silent during the transition because he's got a lot to say, mm -hmm. and he's waiting to say it. Mm -hmm. You were the lone voice during the campaign and now continue to be among a very small minority of outspoken Republicans. So given that the public perception may be that Sass and Flake and some of the others mm -hmm. were ultimately rejected in their anti-Trump or never Trump view, how do you show them mm -hmm. that if they do the things you just prescribed, they can be as momentous and, and garner as much momentum as a Trump tweet. Because mm -hmm. I think your point is well taken, that mm -hmm. if you tweet with that velocity mm -hmm. and build yourself a platform, there are going to be results at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. the question is, in 140 characters, how do you preserve that appeal to intelligence? Well, I would say that it can't just all be about the 140 characters. There's so much that needs to be done. I, I like uh, Senator Booker, Cory Booker's use of, of videos. He you know, does uh, you know, selfie videos or videos that are almost like selfie videos uh, where he delivers a very effective message. And I think the senators who you mentioned, these are the ones who understand the point that you're making. They've got other considerations that at time meant they could speak out or not. And of course, I encourage them to speak out as much as possible. Those you mentioned are the ones who did speak out. There are plenty of others who did not, uh, who, who did not speak out at all. And that's what my concern is. Um, I think that Senator Sass and Senator McCain and Senator Graham uh, and, and Senator Lee as well and others, there, there are others who have shown leadership. 
but my concern is that is others who haven't and what we as Americans do about that. And the way we handle that is to be very, very loud and engaging with those senators and representatives so that they know. See, there's political pressure and political support are are two sides of the same coin, right? So we've got to give pressure and support to members of Congress to stand up to Trump when necessary. And there will be times when Trump does things that conservatives want to see and that liberals don't want to see and conservatives can support those things. There's no problem with that. But when it comes to the defense of our country, the defense of the integrity of our constitution, the integrity of our democratic process, uh, the protection of our basic rights and equality in America, uh, we need our representatives in Congress to do more, that's clear, but it's on us. It is on us until we can put forth people with more courage, people who will not put their, their re-election before the interests of the people. We've got to especially be very loud to motivate them to be vocal. Now, what kind of message resonates? Uh, sure, uh, to some audiences, an intellectual message about uh, the value of democracy and and of uh, the, the dangers of authoritarianism, that's compelling. Um, but we've got to, to make it much more um, relatable to, to more people, and, and I'm speaking to myself in saying that as well. And we also need to go to, to Trump voters, and they're, they're not a monolith, right? There are many different reasons people voted for Trump. But to his most ardent supporters, we need to go to them and we need to hear them. And, and I know that my saying that is controversial. When I say that, I, I get some, some negative feedback sometimes uh, that, that those people are, you know, we, we can't you know, reconcile with those people. They're, they're irreconcilable. I disagree with that. And I think we can never give up on, on our fellow Americans. They do have, just, they do have very justified uh, complaints and there are, many of them are going through very serious struggles. We need to hear them and understand the truth that, that can come from that about part of uh, our country and the challenges people are facing. And then we need to offer them better policy solutions that are more positive rather than the destructive policy uh, proposals in many cases that I think Donald Trump has offered that I don't think will end up ultimately helping people through some of these, these struggles. So that's what we need to do. I was thinking about you during the course of the campaign in its aftermath with the refrain of authoritarianism because it would be in a debate moment when it, it could have been Vice President Biden who more compellingly said in response to what Trump has said about we don't have a country anymore vis-a-vis -vis our borders, well we're not going to have a democracy anymore if you're President of the United States. And I don't think that struck a chord. And Clinton did not say that, but and it might have been Biden who was the more effective messenger or even Sanders. But when it comes to these tweets that are engaging in market manipulation when Trump is, is doing uh, what to Milton Friedman or William F. Buckley would be a sin mm -hmm. of the highest order, and that is calling out companies and engaging in a tit for tat around jobs. You make important points and, and I would say that the kind of capitalist economy that I believe should exist hasn't been uh, produced or, 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 or uh, promoted by Republicans over the last several decades. Instead, we've seen too much crony capitalism. We've seen big businesses thrive while small and medium-sized enterprises struggle under uh, rules and regulations that major corporations and, and major players and in industries are able to craft and promote through the government, but that the smaller players have no voice in. So what we need to do is make sure that we are promoting a, a truly uh, a free economy, an open economy, in which everybody's on equal playing field. You know, when I, when I was uh, serving in Congress as the chief policy director for the House Republicans, you know, there were times when I saw this happening, when I saw uh, major players in an industry pushing some legislation that would essentially regulate that industry, which at first was very confusing to me. Why would, a, why would major players in an industry be asking for regulation of their industry? I mean, in some cases it can be you know, the purpose of that can be to clear up, to clear up uh, regulatory uncertainty, which is sometimes even worse than overregulation. But in other cases, it's because some of these players know that these larger players, larger corporations, they can kill competition, smaller competition, 
through these regulations because they can handle the regulations, but the smaller players can't. So that's what's been happening. So we need an open economy. That's something that, that Republicans have not been very good with over the past several years. They've moved too much into the, the realm of crony capitalism. That needs to change. Um, but I don't believe that some of Trump's proposals, I think some of his rhetoric on, and plans on trade are dangerous. They'll do more harm than good. He's ignoring the, the, uh, the effect of, of automation on some of the same manufacturing jobs that he complains about. Uh, Brookings did a, a study recently that showed that 85% of the manufacturing jobs that we've lost in, in recent years have come from, have come as a result of automation, not trade. So, you know, there are things we need to do. We need to make sure also that we have a safety net for, for Americans, but it should be a safety net that helps them out of poverty, not merely helps them to survive poverty. Even Milton Friedman said that it is uh, appropriate in a, in a vibrant, uh, a dynamic, open economy uh, for there to be a social safety net. How do you branch out from the contemporary Republican Party to build your own platform anew? Well, it's a very good question and one that uh, my team and Mindy Finn, my running mate and I from the election are, are trying to answer. Uh, a lot of it will depend upon how President Trump governs. Uh, now, his advisors have informed Congress, for example, that, that, that the Republican Party is no longer the conservative party. Uh, they've informed Congress that, that the party is no longer the party of Reagan, for example, it's the party of Trump. One example of that from a policy perspective would be Trump's plan to do a $1 trillion uh, infrastructure program, uh, taking on more debt to fund it, which is something that is not a conservative solution to that particular challenge. So, so there are, you know, conservatives in this context, you know, we're going to have to see how Trump governs. Does he govern in conservative ways? And, and does he try to limit the size of government? Does he tr promote open, you know, an open economy? You pointed out some examples of things he did even as president-elect that suggest otherwise, but we'll see how he governs. But that will dictate what's required going forward. I think there certainly is a need in this country for a new conservative movement, uh, certainly under Trump's presidency, if he governs even 50 percent the way he said he was going to govern, you know, we're going to need conservatives, a new conservative movement that will reflect our ideas about limited government, open economies, this sort of thing. Um, but also there's, there's something else that, that we're observing, that my team and I are observing in, in the country, and that is that, that Republicans or conservatives and progressives or liberals they're finding common ground around some very fundamental American ideals, which are you know, liberty and equality and the protection of our democracy and constitution. And I think that is something, depending on, again, how President Trump governs, that is something that may be uh, of equal importance or greater importance to the country. So you have a variety of things that are happening. You have a need for a new conservative movement. I think you probably need a new movement on the left, too. Uh, but I also think that there is, there is a need for an American movement that will be committed to defending the Constitution, liberty and equality, our democracy. And, and I think it's happening organically. I see it happening. And so my team and I, are, we're, we're trying to figure out uh, what our role will be in that context with these multiple needs that we see existing. Last question in the couple of minutes we have left. Yeah. I admire you for what you're doing. I think you were a voice of sanity in a bitterly fought campaign mm -hmm. that lent itself to the polar ends of a spectrum. If you were to do it again, right, what would have to be accomplished in order for an independent candidate who does not have Donald Trump or Ross Perot's wealth, mm -hmm. what did you learn from the experience mm -hmm. that would help you or your successor Mm -hmm. in this effort mm -hmm. be a third party candidate in 2020? Well, I would say first of all that I ran as an independent out of expediency, not out of uh, you know, convenience. And I think that's clear to most uh, observers. Sure. But you know, it, it was, there was a Republican nominee already. I was a conservative. I felt that the American people needed a better choice. An independent candidacy was the way to do it. It was the only way to do it. 
but I, you know, I, I think that I, I did learn what I, sort of what I knew before, but, but learned firsthand what a challenge it is to run as an independent candidate. Uh, you have ballot access considerations, debate stage opportunities or lack thereof. I mean, it's just a whole host of challenges. So I, I think more broad, the, the, the more important point is that um, in this country now where we have, where we're so divided and there's such gridlock, I do believe as a conservative, we need more voices, not fewer voices. Uh, we need more parties to emerge and, and, I, and we need to open up the process. And so I hope that will happen. And frankly, I mean, this is a, a, a topic perhaps for another discussion, but I do believe that both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are ripe for disruption in the same way that Uber disrupted the traditional taxicab industry. Both of these parties are, are old. They have legacy commitments, legacy ideas. They are backward looking. You could see it in the campaigns. I thought in both campaigns on the Democratic side, it's still a commitment to a large centralized government that just can't work. It's just a bureaucratic nightmare, deprives people of liberties and, and is dysfunctional. And on the right side, obviously, with Donald Trump, you see an embracing of bigotry and misogyny uh, among parts of the right. Not all the right, I want to make that clear, but parts of the right that is also backward looking. So. I believe that just like any company, you know, companies have life cycles. They start out fresh and hungry and they make, they take risks and they grow and they meet the needs of the, of the market. And then they, they grow to a size where uh, they don't want to take as many risks because they perceive that they have more to defend than to gain. And so as a result of that, they stop serving their customers well and they end up being disrupted. Now, you know, the Republican Party was once a third party. It broke off from the Whig Party, as many people know, because the Whig Party was flirting with slavery again, and, and Republicans didn't want to do that. They broke off, and it soon became the party of Lincoln. He joined the party a couple of years after it was founded, and, then, and now we have the Republican Party. But parties don't exist forever in this country, and I think we may be nearing a point where, uh, where the, the timing is right over the next decade or two or, or sooner for some major disruption in this regard. You have to start this in 2000, this, this had to be started in 2014, right? People, I think, undersell and underestimate the degree to which Trump benefited from free media as being a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to orchestrate an earnest effort at what you did, start, you got to start in 2018. You got to start, start even before the midterms. But I really appreciate. Evan, your commitment to democracy and uh, preserving our Constitution. Thank you for being with me today. Yeah, thank you very much. My pleasure. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation. With special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.